And I, I come down in the morning, I go to the pool, and I hear this girl in the corner laughing. I hear, are you the guy I hit last night? Because I had a pretty good cut on my lip. And I said, yeah, and I walked over, and it was Janis Joplin. <laughs> and she was sitting with Jimi Hendrix, and Jim Morrison, and um, Creedence Clearwater, Chambers Brothers. And the, my only thought was, oh my God, if I hit the jackpot for a pharmaceutical salesman to walk, <laughs> to walk into that crowd. What was the best advice you ever received? Get the money, don't forget to get the money. <laughs> Always remember to get the money. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Community Made Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaynard. Now, as you know, this season is all about how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships. In the first few episodes of the season, I shared why relationships are the ultimate asset and how a live event back in 2011 fundamentally changed the trajectory of my life. Why great events and live experiences can be the unfair advantage when you're a high growth minded entrepreneur because they deliver on one of our most valuable assets speed, the speed of growth, the speed of wisdom, and the speed of relationships. And in our last episode, I shared three unique stories which served as examples of how to reach the unreachable and befriend celebrities and billionaires. And if you listen to that particular episode, you may remember hearing about my relationship with the legendary Shep Gordon, a man whose name is synonymous with film, music, and the celebrity chef movement. I used many principles shared in the Unreaching the Unreachable episode to connect with Shep. And in today's episode, you're going to hear from him directly as far as my outreach and how that worked and why he said yes, along with his fascinating story, which we captured at our most recent MMT event. A few housekeeping things that I'd like to add before we jump into this intimate conversation. First, we'll be giving away 10 copies of Shep Gordon's book, They Call Me Supermensch, a backstage pass to the amazing worlds of film, food, and rock and roll. We'll be giving that away in the Community Made group. If you're not a member, joining the group is free. Simply visit communitymade.com to get access. Second, I may mention on previous episodes, I decided to take some of the concepts of this season on how to grow, nurture, and amplify business relationships and teach them in a live kind of workshop setting. I love live experiences. To me, nothing beats a live experience. And to my surprise, when I announced it, it sold out about roughly about a day and a half after posting it on Facebook. So I decided to announce a second date. So for dates and availability on that, visit superconnectorworkshop.com. That is superconnectorworkshop.com. And third, if you're a fan of what we're doing here at Community Made, I would be forever grateful if you would share this podcast with a friend. I specifically avoided the traditional marketing methods of building an audience for the podcast because I don't care for vanity metrics. I don't want a lot of listeners. I want the right listeners. And I'm a firm believer that amazing people like yourself know other amazing people. So if you know of someone who would benefit from an episode of this podcast, please send it along to them. Now let's get right to it. I won't keep you from it any longer. Enjoy this intimate conversation with the great Shep Gordon. So uh, this is uh, exciting on many levels. This is actually coming full circle. Where's Clay? Clay's back there. So Clay, probably about two years ago now, he made mention of Shep's name. He's like, you're the Shep Gordon of entrepreneurship. And I didn't know what that meant. Uh, and I just sat with it for a while. And then somebody else within Mastermind Talks messaged me. And he said, have you seen this documentary called Supermensch? And I said, no. But that's not the first time I heard to watch Supermensch. It's not the first time I heard the word the, the name Shep. Um, so he's like, you got to check it out. So I waited a little bit, finally watched it on Netflix. Who has seen the documentary out of curiosity? A handful of people. A lot Fantastic. of people with time on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> So I remember vividly uh, where I was when I watched it. I was with Candace, and I don't watch that many documentaries. I don't watch much uh, anything on TV. Um, but I remember watching it and thinking to myself, if I, I've never had the desire to connect with any big names, Richard Branson, any, I'm, I respect them immensely, but I just never felt drawn to ever kind of meet them. Um, but then when I saw Shep and what people said about Shep, um, I would just felt drawn. I'm like, if I could meet anybody and just learn through osmosis, it would be it'd be Shep. I was just I became a huge fan. Um, and what happened was, I think I have it here. 
I posted the Facebook. <laughs> I've never done this before. I posted the Facebook, and I'm, I actually said I never cared to meet Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, or Richard Branson. I don't respect what they've done immensely. But uh, if I could meet anyone, it would be Shep Gordon. And that was May 16th, less than a little more than a year ago, May 16th, 2016. And uh, I don't know if I have it here in the next slide. I sent a ton of emails to his lovely assistant, Nancy, <laughs> yeah. uh, starting in February of 2016. <laughs> following up in regards to Facebook messages and that kind of stuff, wasn't going anywhere. Um, <laughs> and then I found out that Shep was coming out with a book, uh, basically, which was um, more in-depth, I guess, background on Shep, uh, almost as a memoir of sorts, um, which really kind of took uh, a lot of the things from the documentary. And uh, I reached out to him. I finally found his actual email address because I was emailing with his assistant, and she's lovely, but she's a great gatekeeper. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, so finally found his email, and I CC'd her to be like, I got him. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, you better pass on this message now. And then um, I said, listen, like, I don't know what your intention is with the book. I'm assuming anybody who's doing a book has the goal to sell a lot of copies. But I'm like, I'm committed to your message, and I'd love to help you get it out there and I'm willing to do all the heavy lifting. Um, I'm like, I'm not good at a lot of things, but I know how to, I'm okay with events, uh, and also book marketing. I have a lot of friends who've had very successful books, and I know it's not necessarily rocket science, but it's a hell of a lot of work. So I uh, reached out to him, and uh, we were going back and forth by email. I'm like, you know what? It's gonna be better if we just do a call to hopefully hash this, hash this over. And we did a quick call, and on that call, only lasted a couple minutes. And I said, you know what, it's actually better in person. I will fly to Maui to see you. <laughs> and if this works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. No pressure, no expectations. I planned like a three-day trip. And Chef's like, listen, if you're coming, he was, uh, I don't know if you were surprised or something like that, but he was gracious enough to host me at his house uh, for those three days. And uh, I will say they were, they were three very magical days for me. We walked on the beach almost daily. Uh, spent a lot of time together talking about we had the- We that great dinner that night, right? With um, Joe, was that the night when? There was like 20, 30 yeah, people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, I'm not gonna lie, so I, I landed at like four o'clock that night, and he's like, oh, I have a dinner at like 5.30. And it's like these Emmy Award winning people and all these like big wigs. And again, people see me as this huge social butterfly. I went and I walked in, and then I walked back to my room, and I'm like, I had to like psych myself off to go back home. <laughs> Because I'm like, I've been on a flight for 13 hours, and these are like these people are like not even remotely in my industry, in my league. Um, but they were fantastic. You're a fantastic host, obviously. Um, so uh, yeah, we ended up working together, and uh, we worked on the book. Basically, I flew to to. Uh, no, he worked on the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I flew to um, to to Maui early August. We started working August and September. The book came out in September, and, and thankfully things went well. Uh, on that front, and uh, yeah, so it's just, it's been... So the same story from my point of view. <laughs> is uh, My secretary said, you know, this guy, he's been trying to get a hold of you. I said, not another one, please, just... So, and then she said, no, this, this guy's a little different. And then an email came in, and I read the email, and she said, that's the guy. And, wow, that's weird. And then we got on the phone, and he said to me what I always said to my artists which was, what's your dream for the book? And when I would sign an artist, that was always my first thing. Give me a dream, let me make that, let me manifest that dream, and then you'll know what I do for a living, and you don't have to like, you know, bother me. I'll just go do my thing. And I said, I, you know, my, I'm a Jewish kid from Long Island who never thought I'd ever even read a book, and uh, I'd love to make the New York Times bestseller list. My ego really wants to make it. <laughs> and uh, he said, I can do it. I said, really? And he said, uh, I said, I'll try. I'll yeah. try my best. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I didn't hear that part. <laughs> <laughs> Probably said that very low. Um, and then you showed up in Maui, and it was, uh, the ride's been amazing. And we made the, the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> also, um, Wait, thank you. Um, it, and it was amazing for me to see someone create the man, because that's what I've tried to do my whole life. And I, I dropped out 15 years ago, so I don't really, I wasn't an expert at, at how you navigate it now. And to watch him manipulate, um, <laughs> but, but manipulate in a great way. He didn't manipulate, it, it, it was a win-win situation. He created... Um, 
situations where people who wanted to meet me or wanted to hear stories bought books for the access. So they won, they're all thrilled. I've done four or five dinners and golf games and, and I got what I wanted and it was just beautiful. So thank you, thank you, thank yeah, you. No. You know, we, and, and I must say, it's also because of the help of some, a handful of people within Mastermind Talks. There was somebody who bought a nice book bundle who was part of our community. Um, and then I know Dan Martell, oddly enough, I made mention of the story on stage. And right then and there, when I finished my talk, he's like, uh, what did you offer? You're like, if you do, well, you do a webinar and people have to pay 10, uh, buy 10 books in order to get access to the webinar. And we moved like 200 books or something like that that way. So got to give a little shout out to Dan Martell. Yeah, 200 you. books go far. <clears throat> so this is actually a Q&A I'm, I'm not going to say I'm worried about. But um, <laughs> only in the sense that I know him so well. I've read the book like three times. I've read every single article on him. Um, so uh, for me to be like, where are you from? I already know where he's from. So um, I think the best way to probably approach this is almost do like the life and times of and starting really, I guess, where you were kind of born and raised, what that looked like. The problem with Shep too is that, I mean, these are every single one of these could be a Q&A for uh, the whole evening. I mean, he created the whole celebrity chef movement. He was super influential in the music scene. Um, still is influ influential in the music scene. It was influential in film. Um, there's so many different directions so we, we can go, and we will open it up uh, relatively soon. So I think it would be best to start, I guess, where you grew up and what that looked like. Mm. I, was, um, I was a child of the, uh, of the, of the first wave of suburbia. When people started, move, people, families started making middle income money and started moving out to the suburbs. Um, I lived in New York. Levittown was the first real suburban community. I lived in Oceanside, so um, we had a house that was, a, I think it was ten thousand dollars. It had three bedrooms. It had a backyard, which was remarkable, you know, for us to have a backyard, um, and um, very, very normal upbringing, and when I say normal, couldn't wait to get out of the house. <laughs> like, you know, the clock was ticking from when I was seven or eight years old. When do I leave and go to live my life? And um, won a Regent Scholarship, which is, uh, in New York State, they had a thing called a Regent Scholarship. And the furthest school from my home in New York State was in Buffalo. So I went to the University of Buffalo to get the furthest distance from the home. Um, and um, started to develop um, through completely random um, events a way of dealing with the world. And it manifested itself in a thing called um, the Thallus of Marcania, which is a story I tell that almost nobody ever believes. <laughs> but when I told it in Philadelphia a few months ago, there were four people in the audience who were act actually victims of that marketing ploy. So here's the story. <laughs> So we're studying, in those days you took Dexedrine, you stayed up all night studying for finals. You'd go for two or three days taking speed and get wacky. Um, and we were studying for biology tests and there was a thing called the thallus of Marcanthia, which was the sex organ of a fern. And it sounded like the ruler of a country. That led to, Oh, let's, why don't we send a telegram to Buffalo that the Thalus of Marcandy is coming, a rich oil, the head of a rich oil company, you know, a country from Africa, first visit to America. So, you know, we kids in a school, we, we uh, write a letter, we, someone takes it down to the mayor's office, or I don't remember how it got there, maybe Western Union Telegram. We wake up in the morning thinking it's over, and the front page of the Buffalo Evening News is Thalus of Marcandy is visiting Buffalo, oil rich. So we send the guy, we, we, Take a guy, already shine, we all pulled in money, we send him to New York, we get him sheets and pillowcases so he can look like he's, um, and we, we tell the mayor what flight he's coming on, it's a big announcement on radio that the, the mayor's going to meet him, but we're still, this is like our third day up, so we didn't, why leave it alone? So we called B'nai Brith, and we said, we told B'nai Brith that the Thallus of Marcani is coming, the most anti-Semitic ruler in the world. So B'nai Brith went on a huge campaign. We had 2,000 people show up at the airport for Artie Shine in his sheets coming with pickets who actually, luckily nobody got hurt, 
but they broke through the window of the Buffalo airport to get to the plane to pick it, send the thallus back. Uh, there was a picture in the documentary of her room. Um, and that sort of, that, that started my journey of learning how to sort of manipulate the news to earn a living. <laughs> Yeah, we, we have many stories to pull from that are very similar to those. Um, so university, what did you go to university Went for? Went to the University of Buffalo, took sociology. What did you do with that? Um, nothing, but I, I, um, I went to the new school for social research for uh, graduate school for a few weeks and um, didn't like it. And a recruiter came to the new school who was from the probation department of California. And this was... 1968 when Reagan was the governor and they were really hassling hippies and by this time in my life I had become a uh, we have I went to this thing that I'd become an acid head um, so I was um, I was out there I was um, I, I always thought of myself as um, like a guy on a white horse to save people and I said I'm gonna go to California get a job as a probation officer and save these kids um, who were getting abused by Reagan. So I got the job, went out to California, had, had my acid in the car, <laughs> go into the jail for the first day. And um, I had hair down to here in California in 1967. wasn't a good thing. Yeah. And um, the, uh, they sent me out to, uh, my first assignment was to uh, guard at this softball game that the kids were doing. And they started walking towards me, and I realized there were no other guards. And I became sort of the softball, because the guards wanted me to get out of the jail. They hated me more than the inmates. So um, I left that night. I quit. It was like they beat me up a little bit, but not bad. And um, the kids could have really hurt me, but they were really cool. They got around me in a circle. Obviously, they had been set up. They sort of gave me a hint of what was happening. They said, we're not going to hurt you, but we're going to. And they started to hit me with the bats and stuff, but no bruises. So I drive into uh, maybe $300 to my name, but a lot of acid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I drive into Hollywood, and I see a vacancy sign at a motel. And I check into the motel, and I, room 224 was like Ca Hotel California. It was one of those swimming pool, motel around the swimming pool, two stories. Um, I go out on my patio. I take a little acid, thinking my life is completely fucked. I've now, you know, been thrown out of a jail. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and I hear this girl screaming. And I'm, you know, I, my image of myself has always been like the guy on the white horse, going to save the day. And I've just come from a jail, and I'm really high. And I think of rape. I don't think of any, you know, my, my thoughts are negative. Um, and I run down, and there's two people, and I separate them, and the girl punches me, and they were making love. <laughs> Small error. Um, <laughs> so I go back up to my room, and now I'm completely convinced my life is fucked. <laughs> um, and I, I come down in the morning, I go to the pool, and I hear this girl in the corner laughing. And I hear, oh, are you the guy I hit last night? Because I had a pretty good cut on my lip. And I said, yeah, and I walked over, and it was Janis Joplin. Oh. And she was sitting with Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison and um, Creedence Clearwater, Chambers Brothers. And the, my only thought was, oh, my God, if I hit the jackpot for a pharmaceutical salesman to walk, <laughs> <laughs> to walk into that crowd. So, that, so for the next few months, I sort of with a pharmaceutical salesman, like the happiest guy in the world. I had more customers with, you know, with money who could do stuff. And then one day, Jimi Hendrix says to me, um, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, you know, this is sort of what I do for a living. And he said, and, um, and I had just bought, I was doing very well, and I uh, had just bought a 1954 Cadillac limousine for maybe $300, but it was cool. And he said, what are you going to tell the police if they stop you and say, where'd you get the money for your car? And I said, well, you know, I come from middle class Long Island. No police ask me about anything. He said, well, I come from Watts. If I wear a watch, I better be able to tell them where I got the watch. And uh, 
I said, gee, I don't know. He said, you Jewish? And I said, yeah. He said, you should be a manager. <laughs> <laughs> Great, who should I manage? So he turned to the Chambers brothers and he said, is that freaky guy still in your basement, Alice Cooper? And he said, yes. He, Jimmy said to me, could you afford $20 a week? So I said, yeah, absolutely. So Lester went, and Alice tells the story of Lester coming, Lester Chambers walking in and saying, I found a Jew who can manage you and who'll give you $20 a week. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is my 50th year with Alice Cooper. Wow. Uh, and one thing we'll talk about, I really want to make sure we don't forget. Actually, we talk about it right now. You've never had a contract with Alice. No, nah, still don't. He's yeah. never had a contract with any uh, of your artists, no. yeah. um, which... To me is bananas. Like I, I, talk, I know a handful of people in the, in the music industry, and especially when it comes to managers. There's a lot of artists that feel like they outgrow their managers, mm -hmm. um, and they have that tough conversation when it comes time to like, you know, it's time to move on. But the fact that you've had these these lifelong relationship with your artists, and we'll go through some of them, uh, is nothing short of amazing. I, I, think, I think what's important for what I did, you know, the to to manage an artist properly, you got to get ahead of them. And you got to take chances, and you got to go to the edge. And when you go to the edge, you're always going to fail at times. And if your bond is on a piece of paper, that failure gets ugly. If your bond is a heart and mind and love connection, then you support each other when you fail. I heard Zach today talk about failure. And um, by the way, your speech was unbelievable today. I, t I told him when I walked in, there's a, a thing in, ho in Hollywood, never follow animal acts or children. I said, I'm adding to that, never follow animal acts, children, or Zach. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for sharing everything with us today. It was really special. Um, so I, you know, it, it gave me the ability to fail and not have someone think that you know, I'm tied to this person because of a contract. Um, they were tied to me because of the job I did. And if it became because of some other reason, I lost my value. Because faith is 90% of what you do if you, if you do it properly. It's easy to you know, be a manager who gets Coca-Colas for someone. But if you're going to stay ahead of them and tell them where to go, there are times they're going to fall in a hole. And um, those are the moments that are more important than the successes, um, the ability to fail. So, so let's talk, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Alice's career uh, a little bit. So when you originally, so when you, you met Alice for the first time, what did that look like? Did you, did you see him and well, say, this did, is going to be a jackpot? Oh, no, no, no. no. The, the, <laughs> the beauty of Alice for me was that he, they were so bad that I would never have to work at it. Because <laughs> um, it was a front. I was a dealer. I was a pharmaceutical salesman. I didn't want to rock, go rock and roll, manage. I didn't want to do it. So it was a perfect thing. Alice says um, that we met on a lie. He told me he was a singer. I told him I was a manager. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was interesting because he was so bad that he would drive people out of the buildings. So like I saw him the first time opening for Jim Morrison in the doors. And by the time Alice was off, everybody had left the building. <laughs> and I understood it. And that was, and that was sort of, it was great for me because I didn't have to work. But then came a moment when everybody in my circle started getting arrested, getting busted. Um, and I knew I had to stop with my pharmaceutical career. <laughs> so I sat down with Alice and I said, listen, I'm, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna do, uh, somehow I'm becoming a millionaire. If you wanna do it together, let's say we'll figure it out. If not, no problem, I'm moving on. So we shook hands and said, we're gonna try and do it. And we sat down and we said, okay, what is our strength? Our strength is that we can get people to hate us. So how, does, how, do, we make, how do we monetize that? <laughs> and, it, and, and it became so obvious. I mean, it was, so, it was so obvious to us once that thought went into our head that that was the common thread of every superstar. Elvis Presley, you couldn't see his hips on television because it was too disgusting. The thing they had in common was they got parents to say, don't go see this act. Yeah. And there's a, I, I, later on I talk about it as cultural waves, but if, if you can be the face of a cultural wave, that's real monetization. And um, 
rebellion against your parents, there's no bigger cultural wave. So once we hit on that, we always knew what to do. It wasn't about being the best musician. It was about irritating the parents the best we could. <laughs> so Alice Cooper in a dress, that, there was no parent happy with that. Um, Alice Cooper with snakes. Alice Co the first stunt we tried to pull off, which was a complete failure, once we, the light bulb went on, we said, okay, well, let's, let's get arrested. Because for us, it, what we realized that we needed parents, not children. So Rolling Stone didn't matter to us. What mattered is with the LA Times, Newsweek magazine. We needed parents over the breakfast table to say, you're not into this Alice Cooper guy. If you, are, if you go to his show, I'm grounding you, knowing that that would drive him right to the show. So the first thing, uh, I said, I got it. I know exactly what to do. We're going to make up clear plastic outfits. You're going to get on stage completely naked. I'll call the police. You get busted for upset, you know, being obscene. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> Guys, this is going to be, you're going to be the biggest thing ever. So we make up these clear plastic clothes, um, no underwear, place called uh, The Experience on Sunset. I paid the guy $50 to put Alice on for 20 minutes. And um, in those days, there were no cell phones or anything. So they get on stage completely naked. There's maybe three people in the room. And I go to a phone booth, um, at the, which is the only thing you had. And I called 911 or whatever it was at that time. And I said, this is the most disgusting thing. I have my children here. There's five guys with hair down to their legs, uh, completely naked. I'm looking at their genitals. I have a 12-year-old daughter. This is disgusting. And, uh, Sirens are coming. I find, I hear, you know, this is the greatest. And I, and I walk outside, and by the time the police got there, the heat from their body steamed up the plastic. You couldn't see anything. The police walked in and walked out. And we all sat down and said, okay, this is, we actually couldn't get arrested. <laughs> this is why, and we left LA and decided until we could get a standing ovation. We would, but that was our first real attempt at it. And then everything we did for till today is, um, you know, is based on irritating parents. Um, that's our thought process for everything, is how do we irritate parents? Um, so, so how long was it before you started to see there's actually something here like? 72, uh, I started with Alice in 68. 72, we had the biggest tour in the world. It was, there's a book out about 72 tours, it was Zeppelin, Alice, and The Who were the three biggest tours of 72. Um, so four years. Four years, yeah, it happened really fast. We got very, it, we hit a nerve that was perfect, um, and we hit a time that was perfect. Um, Newsweek did a big story about this disgusting band. In uh, England, they tried, we, we did a thing, when we first went to England, we got a, a huge billboard made up of Alice naked we broke down with the story, actually. We get to England, we haven't sold a lot of tickets. So how many tickets, this is actually, I think, a phenomenal story. Because I think of like Ryan Holiday's part of our community has Trust Me, I'm Lying. This is like the original Ryan Holiday <laughs> back in his day. So hold on, so you, you guys never went to the UK. We never went to the UK. You brought him so, over to the UK. How many tickets did you have sold? First time we were in Wembley, it was 8,000 seats. We had about 600 tickets sold and for an 8,000 seater. How, how, we're about, how, how about close? two weeks out. 10 days out, two weeks out. And um, I get there and it's, and we were on Warner Brothers Records and they had a fellow there named Derek Taylor, who's known as the, uh, the fifth Beatle. He was their publicist, really smart guy. Always had a cigarette dangled down. So I get to London and I'm sort of in a panic because it's 600 tickets and I'm a young guy. I've never been to London. I don't know anything. I'm living on bounce checks, basically. Because um, in those days, people would take checks. They don't do it anymore. Um, and um, I, they, the president of the company says, Derek can help you. I go to Derek's office, and George Harrison's in the office. Um, Harry Nielsen's in the office. Um, they were all drinking and drunk, and I probably had to wait five hours till I could get an audience with Derek. And I said, uh, hi, I'm Alice Cooper's manager. And he says, who's Alice Cooper? And I said, oh, God, am I fucked. He doesn't even... <laughs> And we're on his label, and he doesn't know who we are. How am I going to sell 7,000 tickets? And uh, he says, tell me about Alice Cooper. And I tell him about Alice Cooper. And I, he, I said, um, our goal is to irritate every parent in England. 
that's, that's what I need your help with. How do I, so the conversation started and then it went to what is every parent, how, how do I touch them? Breakfast TV. Breakfast TV in England, huge audiences, um, families get around, watch it, okay? What's on breakfast TV? Well, they do the weather a lot, they do like soybean uh, prices, and they do a lot of traffic. So, mm, traffic, wow, that's interesting. What's the busiest intersection in, uh, in England? Uh, Piccadilly. I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, you think, um, I said, I have this really cool picture of Alice naked. Would you guys by any chance pay for like, maybe we get a billboard truck and break it down in Piccadilly Circus and get the breakfast news to see this completely naked picture of a guy named Alice Cooper? <laughs> and he went for it. And we broke the truck down twice. <laughs> We paid the guy to go to jail. The truck driver went to jail. We had girls in hot pants, because this is 1971 or two. So hot pants and girls, they're giving out flyers for the show. <laughs> well, traffic's backed up for 28 miles. <laughs> it's all over the news. The next day in Parliament, Lady Whitehouse um, puts, puts in a bill to ban Alice from England. So we get the front page of the paper, sell out that afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Alice Cooper was one of the biggest artists. He had a good run. In, yeah. in that time period. Cause, and, and which would have been his, what would have been the high of his career when he played in Seven, Toronto? 73, 74. 73, 74. Yeah. Yeah. School's out, it, billion dollar babies. Um, you know, that, that period. 72 was the biggest tour. That, but, but you know, it, it was so, the economy, the scale was so different. In 72, we sold out Madison Square Garden. Top ticket price was $3.50. So it's a whole, it was a different world. These, you know, you think about Hendrix and Morrison, and if any of them made 10000 a night, that was gigantic. Um, you know, you go to shows that had Janice, The Doors, and um, Love on it, and it would be $2.75 for the three acts in a 2,000-seat building. There was no money. It was a very different thing. Most of the guys didn't have cars. Um, I, I tell this story, that I, I was managing Ann Murray and I, I knew I needed to do something to make her really famous and I, I always use this thing, guilt by association. You put someone famous next to someone and it bleeds off. So um, there was a group, a drinking group that um, Alice had called the Hollywood Vampires and it was John Lennon, Harry Nielsen, Keith Moon, Mickey Dolenz, and I, none of them had cars. Everybody would either hitchhike or get rides or walk because nobody had money for cars. I had, the, I had the 54 Cadillac limousine. <laughs> so I went to them and I said, if you guys want me to drive you anymore, you gotta take a picture with Ann Murray. And they all came and sort of changed their career. But that, that, those days, no one had cars. They didn't have money. It was a different thing. It was just different. You know, Jim Moore, I don't think anybody owned the house they lived in. Everybody was renting and barely renting. Um, it was a different economy. It's just very different. You made your money on records, but record companies didn't pay you. So, so was Ann Murray the second artist? Ann Murray was my second artist. And for those who don't know Ann Murray, she is completely opposite from <laughs> as far as I could get. Yeah, I, I wanted actually, to sort of see if I was I lucky with Alice or did I have some skills? Was I going to stay doing it? And Ann Murray was as far as I could get from Alice, um, but it, the same rules applied. Really was the same thing. Although with her, we didn't piss off parents. Yeah. <laughs> was, but after, so up until that photo, she was wasn't necessarily. She she had had a hit record, Snowbird, but she wasn't cool, so she didn't get Rolling Stone. She couldn't get Midnight Special. That picture put her into the cool league. Mm. So she got um, she hosted Midnight Special. From being turned down, she got on the cover of Rolling Stone. Um, all the cool places, because she was standing next to John Lennon during his dark period where no one had seen a picture of John for probably eight months. Mm -hmm. It was that dark period in John Lennon's life. Um, so that, it became big news. And it was John Lennon and Mickey Dolenz on both sides of her. So the monkeys and the Beatles in the middle. And who's this girl in the middle? It became a real you know, endorsement. So we have Alice, we have Anne Murray, who was the third artist for Groucho you? Marx. Groucho Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Which was amazing. <laughs> he used to always, he'd 
he'd, he'd, uh, we'd be at a table or something, he'd go, who's this guy sitting next to me? And if he'd say, you know, that Shep, your manager. He'd look at me, you're my manager, Shep? And I'd say, yeah, graduate. Funny, it'll look like a crook. <laughs> <laughs> so where did, who came first? Was it Luther or Teddy? Uh, Teddy. It was Teddy yeah. that came first. Right. So that's actually, do you want to tell the story as far as <laughs> what, what those are for? I don't know if you saw this. Son. So uh, these were very significant in uh, my so life. Teddy I can't just, believe that they made these up. There's a guy on the wall over yeah. there. Teddy Pendergrass was rapidly becoming the Black Elvis. He was um, an amazing, um, he was the voice of Harold Melvin and then went out on his own. I'll wake up everybody if anybody knows those kind of songs. But he was, he was... Um, sex personified. And um, my job was to define that, that every, you couldn't get any bigger in the Afro-American world than Teddy. But the white world hadn't discovered him. So my job was sort of to try and make it easy for them to join the party. And um, what he had that was so unique was the sexual appeal to everyone. Even my mother was like, oh my God, this guy's. Um, so, how do you say that without being arrogant? Because once you say it, you lose what it is. Um, so, I, I came to him with the idea. I said, I got it, Teddy. I know exactly. We're going to do concerts for women only. Um, and we're going to do an ad that's not you. It's gonna, we're going to make it soft. It's going to be a teddy bear, because that was his nickname, with a little note on it that says, come spend the night with me. Love, Teddy. Um, and everyone told us we couldn't do it. The lawyers said we couldn't do it because you can't only sell the women. The record company said you'll alienate men. Um, everybody was against it, but he trusted me. And um, one of the things we did was gave out chocolate teddy, teddy bear lollipops to every woman in the audience so we would get pictures of like 5,000 people going... <laughs> biting his head off in the middle of his song. And it worked. It was really great. And it really sort of defined this career. But that's as a manager. And, I, you know, as a branding person, you try and get it down to one or two words. Luther Vandross, who I also managed, who might appear to someone to be in the same category, how do you differentiate a Teddy from a Luther? Luther was about romance. Teddy was about sex. So with Luther, I held in 30 markets on the biggest radio stations, um, contest to have Luther marry you on the air. So we did live weddings on the air, and for the next four or five years, Luther's music was the number one music played at weddings. It sort of drove the point across. Um, no lollipops for Luther. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to skip around too much, but how did you, how did you hear of Teddy, and how did that relationship <laughs> come to be? Um, I always did things a little different. So um, I had gotten, uh, Groucho, the executor of Groucho Marx's estate was a wonderful guy who was also chairman of CBS, Goddard Lieberson, um, who was a bigger than life character. Goddard was remarkable. Um, and he called me up and asked, said that he had this artist who he thought could be really big and it needed a manager and he wanted me to be the manager would I go to Philadelphia to see him? So I went to Philadelphia, not realizing that Teddy was the voice of Harold Melvin. Out of all the artists that you've managed, and there, there, there's more, um, but would I be, it would be safe to assume that you're probably most proud about his career? Um, no, Alice probably most probably proud. Alice. Yeah, I would say for me, because that's like, you know, we, we sort of created that. Everything else I, I jumped on board of, um, Alice is, we created this sort of character that we're really proud of. But you changed history on some level with, with Teddy. Cause, yeah, cause yeah. Well, Teddy, I'm very proud of Teddy because there, there was a whole different set of, of things. Um, when I started with Teddy, we went, I went to the first show. It was in Biloxi, Mississippi, in a hall that Alice had played. And um, everything was different. There was, um, we didn't get paid. The guy gave him a ring finally because I took the promoter in the bathroom and told him I was going to kill him, and he gave me the ring off his finger. And I learned about this thing called the Chitlin Circuit. Um, the Chitlin Circuit, which was a real thing, if you Google it, for any of you, it was um, 
Afro-American artists only played in the Chitlin circuit. And, it, you know, you'd always hear stories about how they get the keys to a car and then the car would get taken back. But it was a circuit that existed um, of promoters and record companies. The record company would tell the artist that they had to play for a radio station in Cleveland. They'd go to Cleveland, play for a promoter who was in cahoots with the radio station. They wouldn't pay the artist. Um, and life would go on. And um, when I, I said, what, are you crazy? Are you, are you like nuts? Um, and he, re- he, he sort of really explained it to me. And I said, um, I, 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 either I'm leaving, and you're on here if you want to live with this, or fuck him, we're going to break this thing. And at that point, he said to me, listen, Chip, I didn't want to tell you this before, but the um, reason I don't have a manager is my last manager was shot to death. I said, ooh, <laughs> well, maybe we won't play the chip. No. <laughs> but I didn't really care. I, I was a single guy. I didn't really care. And it just seemed so unjust to me and so wrong that I said, are you willing to, are you willing to die for it? And he said, if you're in, I'm in. And um, we broke the circuit. It was tough. Um, there were, um, it was very organized. There was a thing called the Black Promoters Association who were represented by some very powerful figures who are way too famous for me to mention because they're still alive. Um, but we, for the first 20 shows we did for white promoters, we got picketed, we got death threats, we had uh, FBI protection. Um, it got, re- two guys got pistol whipped in my office. Um, it got really heavy and finally we negotiated a deal with them um, which allowed everybody to sort of coexist. But it broke the Chitlin circuit, and then Earth, Wind, and Fire started playing for white promoters. Um, and that sort of and then P Funk started to play for white promoters, and then all of a sudden they were getting paid. So then the Black Promoters Association had to start paying them to stay in the game. And um, I, the BBC is just in the middle of a documentary on Teddy and the breaking of the Chitlin circuit, which I'm really proud of. It was really bold, and really, really bold. So we could go on with more stories about you in the music industry uh, and who you managed and more stunts, uh, but you went from music to film and produced a lot of film. A lot of film. This would have been ever in the heard 80s? Of. Yeah. This was, this was at a time um, there was no American independent film companies. They were all foreign films that came here. There were very few theaters that showed um, foreign films. Um, and it was right when video cassettes were exploding. And I, I'm a manager. I was never a filmmaker. So, but artists didn't have a way to express themselves. Um, there was, unless it was a big movie with committees making them, an artist couldn't have a vision and make it work. And I started a company called Island Alive. And I don't know if any of you know of Koyana Scotsi or uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman, Wales of August, um, Stop Making Sense. The uh, Talking Heads, Jonathan Demme directed. Um, we did movies that, that people didn't particularly see, but were very acclaimed. Won the Cannes Film Festival with my first movie, which was Ridley Scott's first movie, The Duelist, um, the Joseph Conrad sort of story, um, and had a great run at it. Um, it was uh, really fulfilling because it was sort of was the same thing as the music. It gave it gave artists an opportunity to tell their story and. You know, the Chitlin circuit in films was the, the big movie studios. They controlled everything. They told you what to do. They, they took your vision as an artist, as a writer, a director, and by committee changed it. Into, you know, oh, uh, it needs a leading man. Oh, we got to have a beautiful woman. Had nothing to do with the story that someone was trying to say. Um, so I made all, all of Sam Shepard's movies, um, all of Alan Rudolph's movies, um, Godfrey Reggio. There certain, that was basically what I did is work with directors and gave them the freedom to go make their movies. Um, so. And when you were, you were visiting, I'm guessing, can yearly, annually? Yeah. Yeah. I had um, a movie in the Cannes Film Festival 12 years in a row. 12 years in a row, yeah. wow. Yeah. Uh, which takes you almost to your next chapter, in essence. Yeah. So uh, you're at Cannes and... I'm at Cannes. I've just won... Um, with the Duelist, I did that for Paramount Pictures. They took me to a restaurant in the 
hills of Khan called the Moulin des Mujan. And I was a very young guy. I think I was 24, 25. Way too successful. Uh, managing all these artists. Just won the Cannes Film Festival. Um, owned the hottest nightclub in LA, a place called Carlos and Charlie's. Um, was w way too much drugs, way too much success. Um, and sort of knew I was at risk because, you know, Jim Morrison had died, Janice had died. People in my sphere were, you know, there, there wasn't rehab in those days, so that wasn't even part of the conversation. They just died. Um, so I, I, go to, I get taken to the restaurant, and in the restaurant are Anthony Quinn and James Coburn and uh, Barbara Streisand and Pavarotti and um, Clint Eastwood. And almost everybody in the restaurant is smoking. Knees are <laughs> shaking. Every, nobody's looking at the table. They're all looking to see who the next person coming in is. Sweat on foreheads. And I'm looking at everybody saying, holy shit, that's going to be me. Oh, fuck. Is that really what, what I did all this work for? And then into the room walked this beautiful man dressed in white with white hair, like a, sort of like a quiet pool in a jungle, you know, like the, at the bottom of a waterfall, just this beautiful like a Disney movie kind of character. And um, the room became very silent. You could see that he was the pow a real power figure. James Coburn jumped up and grabbed him. Anthony Quinn gave him a hug. And I've always been very attracted to power. I'm a power groupie completely. You know, I just love to be near um, power and have it bleed off. So I was fascinated by this calm guy who seemed to be the power in the room. And I wasn't a foodie at all. I was a macaroni and ketchup kind of guy. Um, so I knew nothing about the culinary world, but I, I decided this guy was going to save my life. Um, he was going to, he was, this was my savior. So I waited till everybody left. The, you know, he was having a drink with someone, the restaurant was empty, and I went over to him. And I said, hi, uh, I won the Cannes Film Festival yesterday. And, oh, fantastic. And I said, you know what, there's a TV show in America called Kung Fu. I would love to be your grasshopper. And uh, uh, what is this grasshopper? And I said, well, no, I just, you know, I'd like to be around you. Is there any way I can be around you? And he said, do you cook? And I said, no. And he said, well, if you learn to cook, I'll let you work in my kitchen for a couple of days, and you can be around me. So I said, how do I learn to cook? And he wrote down the names of a couple of cooking schools. And I went to both schools, Marcella Hansen and Bologna, and Charlie's at the Oriental in Bangkok. And I had a movie the next year. I came back the next year, and I went up to the restaurant. I'm here. And he had no idea who I was. <laughs> I mean, no, I, you know, I was one of a million people. That, and I said, well, you told me if I went to these schools and I went to him, I could work in your kitchen. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to Bangkok to the Oriental for a promotion right after the festival. So I, can I come with you? And he's so gracious, and I could see he was so confused. Yeah. But he said, uh, but of course, if you would like to. So I went to Bangkok with him, which started my journey with him for the next 25 years. His name was uh, Mr. Verger, Roger Verger. Turned out he was the inventor of Nouveau Cuisine with Paul Bocuse, and sort of the godfather of the culinary movement. And um, so gracious. And, and I had films the next 10 years. So we got into this rhythm. I would rent the bus. I would invite three people. He would invite three people. And we'd go to Cognac one year. We'd go to Champagne one year. We'd go to Burgundy one year. We'd go eat and drink. And I, I became his grasshopper. And um, he would come to America a couple of times a year. And just like in every other profession, because he was the top of the heap, all the chefs would come to see him. So I got to meet Wolfgang and Nobu. And, all the guys that we know now, and I got to know them as the grasshopper. I was the guy who took his chair out. I took his coat. I put it on the chair. I'd open his napkin, put it on his thing. I was a very happy grasshopper. But slowly, they all started to see that I had another life, because I was managing 20 acts at the time. Um, and I was living with Sharon Stone. So I, you know, the grasshopper would bring Sharon Stone to the dinner, like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> And he's not pulling her chair out, he's pulling his chair out. Um, and, um, and then at one point I said to Mr. Verger that um, 
we've been to 20 years, I've been going to dinners with you where you go to the kitchen and I put on a suit and go to a table. And I'm a back of the house guy, I'm a manager. I don't wanna be in a seat, let me, let me be your road manager for a tour. So I went out with him and I was blown away at the lack of respect he got from the buyers. He didn't get paid, like, you know, who do I get paid for? Mr. Oh no, I do not take money for this. Like, you don't take money for it, what are you crazy? It's like, um, always the worst room in the hotel, they make them pay for incidentals, it was insane. And we got to the last gig on this run, which was up in Northern California. People had paid $2,500 to have uh, a lunch and a dinner with them and a cooking lesson and a motel room at the Highlands Inn and right here. Yeah. Highlands Inn and Carmel was right here actually. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's right here. Um, they called it a master chef series. They gave him a room that was next to the garbage dump that was so bad that I had lied to him. I went down the street to a different motel rented him a room because the hotel was sold out because of him and told him that they wanted him to stay in a much nicer place, never told him that, that what they gave him. And, and Roy Yamaguchi was cooking the next night and I had always wanted Mr. Verger to come to Hawaii with me. So I figured by food I would get him to Hawaii. So I talked him into staying one more day to try Roy's food. And um, when we got to the restaurant, the maitre d', who was a very nice man, pulled me in the corner, he said, I am so sorry, Mr. Gordon, but we have a rule here, the help can't eat in the dining room, but I'll feed you at the bar for free. And I said, and who is the help? And he said, well, Mr. Verjean, you didn't pay him. I paid for his room, you call that help? That's the help? Um, and they said, anyone, and I just freaked out. And I said to Verjean, um, you can't do this anymore. From now on, I'm gonna, you know, I'll do what I do and help you. And I got on an airplane and I went to uh, Kauai, uh, to the Big Island, and I had Kenny Loggins doing a show for a Nissan and getting paid a fortune. Ken Kenny's normal fee was maybe 50,000. We got, a, in those days, corporate work was very strong. We got 150,000, 25 tickets, suites. And I get there and I see Wolfgang sitting. I say, hey Wolf, how you doing? And he knew me from Verge's groupie, uh, but then had learned who I was a little bit. And uh, I told him the story about the Highland Inn. And he said, hmm, that's great. He said, let me tell you my story. They asked me to come cook two first class tickets. I got to the airport, they were two coach tickets. They called me up last week and said, we can't source the food for your dinner. Can you bring it with you? So I had 100 pounds of food on the plane. Nobody shows up at the airport to pick me up. I call up and they say, oh, it's just too busy. Come in a cab. So I get in a cab. I take the food, two cabs, because I couldn't get it in one. I get the food there, and they say, oh, we're really sorry, but our refrigerator is filled. And they give them a rack. I don't know if you guys know kitchen, a rack. There's a hotel a quarter of a mile down the road, just take it there. And he's wheeling his food and had to wheel it back. And I said, how much they pay? He said, no, they didn't pay me. And I said, You're out of, you guys are all out of your mind. You're like crazy. So I get back to LA about two days later, three days later, and Wolf calls me up and asks me to come over to uh, Spago for lunch. And I'm driving over and I realize they're not open for lunch. And I walk in and there's all the great chefs of America, um, Paul Prudhomme, Alice Waters, Wolfgang, Nobu, um, everybody. Uh, I think there were 48 or 49 of them with a big sign at the back of the hall saying, help! <laughs> and I started a chef's agency that day, 92. And, um, <laughs> and uh, pretty amazing, because I just, I just came from an auction where they auctioned off Emerald to come to your house and cook for dinner, and you got $250,000 for a charity. Twice, two couples bought it. Wow. So it went from never getting paid to a half a million dollars for a meal. So. And, um, and I think about to, I think we're going to see a great phase in the culinary movement now of... Um, real concern to feed people who are hungry. You know, I think all the chefs have now conquered making meals for rich people and realize that they have an obligation to, to feed people who are hungry in a very selfish way, because if they don't, people are gonna just burn down their restaurants. You know, the, the world, we need to feed people. We, hungry people don't do good stuff. Um, so anyway.
That, that was my culinary journey. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody needs reservations. <laughs> I want you to share the story about how you met Emerald, because I think I became a huge Emerald fan, yeah. fan after I heard this story. So, so um, I, I, um, this is before 92. Um, this is maybe in 90, 89, 90. Um, I have a very good friend who had just taken over um, EMI Records. And it was the weekend of the Jazz Fest. And he wanted to go to Jazz Fest. It was also his birthday. So he invited me to come down. He had the corporate plane for the first time. He was very proud, you know, come with me. Um, and he said, uh, you know, get us reservations for dinner. You're the food guy. So um, I called up Mr. Verger, and I said, New Orleans. And he said, Paul Prudhomme. And I said, would you call him for us? And he said, absolutely. You call him back, I said, I spoke to Paul, and you covered. It was two nights. We were going to eat there both nights. So um, we go there. I had a friend of mine, George Greif, who was a bon vivant. He, uh, he married a girl who was on the, the line at the Copacabana. He managed Billy Eckstein. He was a throwback, always a handkerchief, a big fedora, and a pain in the ass at all times. <laughs> and I loved him. Um, and a foodie. So anyway, we get... We go there, we're not so proud, we're going to Paul Prudhomme's for shave. You know, we are so cool. Uh, Fouché hooked us up, the limo pulls up, we go, there's a line, I go to the front of the line. Uh, Mr. Prudhomme knows we're coming. Oh yeah, go, <laughs> go to the back of the line. So now we're waiting on line, and it's like, okay, now we get in, we get taken to a communal table. Now in those days, communal tables were no no's. That's the only communal table I had, first communal table I ever saw in my life was that night at Paul Prudhomme's. So now we're sitting with four people we don't know. Okay, we order a Cajun Bloody Mary, really good, have an appetizer. Second course is ready to come out. I say, could I have a second Cajun Bloody Mary? Uh, no, you can only have it with appetizers. I say, you can't even, no, you can go wait on the line again, it's starting. Well, we guess the Mr. Prudhomme maybe. So he comes out of the kitchen. And uh, hi, how are you, how are you? I said, I just wanted to get another. He said, well, you have to go back and wait on the line. <laughs> So this night is turning into a disaster. So now we're supposed to go back the next night. And none of us want to go back the next night. So I, I can't pick the restaurant anymore. I picked this. Is, this is my pick. So, Jim, where would you like to go? Commander's Palace. My friend George, who's a pain in the ass, fucking Commander's Palace. You gotta, they pull buses up to that place. I ain't eating at a fucking place. Where they have buses. <laughs> no, George, we're eating there. So, um, and you have, to, you have to wear a jacket. So I had to go out and buy a jacket. He happened to have a jacket. So now we get there. And it's a, the same half glasses from the guy from Waters, the maitre d'. You know, we give him the name. And he says, uh, be about 30 minutes. Take him to the bar. To get to the bar at Commander's Palace, you go through the kitchen. So we're now all so pissed off. I'm like kicking George to shut up. What the fuck are we doing here? And I catch the eye of a guy at the line. And he comes over and he gives me this big hug. Hey, man, how you doing? Uh, great. You know, it'd be really even better if we got a table. He said, you don't have a table yet? Come on. Come with me. So uh, he takes us to the bar. He gets a bottle of champagne. He empties the bottle in the four glasses. He'll be right back. And two minutes later, he's back, and he takes us to a table overlooking the terrace, obviously the A table in the place. And uh, he said, what, can I make your meal? Sure. And he leaves, and we're all going, like, who does he think we are? Like, but we better not ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and he brings up every course. Him and like four waiters present every course. And every time he leaves, we're just getting silly. You know, who the fuck does he think we are? <laughs> so the meal's over, and my friend George pulls him over. Okay, sit out here. And who do you think we are? And he says, you know, I have no idea who you are, but I, I've been cooking here. I do 1,000 meals a day of other people's recipes. It's so boring. And so every once in a while, I see someone come through who looks like they might enjoy being taken on a ride, and I take them on a ride, and you look like you'd enjoy it. So I said, wow, that's amazing. So said, what are you doing now? So I said, well, we're trying to get into Tipitina's because the Neville brothers are playing. And he said, I got you covered. And he gives us a note. He writes a note to give to the backstage doorman. And we're like, holy shit. You know, this is, I'm a manager. He's the head of EMI. So this guy's getting us into Tipitina's. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> We get it back in the, lim uh, the limo, we get ready to go, and there's a knock on the window, and he, his, his head comes in, he says, you guys like cognac? Yeah, oh yeah, we like everything. 
So he, <laughs> he, has, he has this bottle of cognac, pours it into four paper cups, and it was emerald. So that day in 92 at Spago, when I agreed to do it, I said to the guys, but there's one guy who I want to add to the group. He doesn't have his own restaurant. He's not famous, He'll be, but I'm not going to do it unless you let me put this guy in. And they said, okay. So I called up Commander's Palace and asked for him, and he had quit. And it just opened Emeralds. And, um, and you built out his career. We helped each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's more stories about more industries, <laughs> but I want to be very respectful of your time and everybody's time and open it up to a quick Q&A should anybody have any questions. Mr. Todd Herman, we'll get a mic real quick. So Todd right there. Uh, well, first off, it's an honor to meet the person who fucked with my head with the movie People Under the Stairs when I was a, a small child. You're the guy uh, who saw it. Yeah. 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 That, that movie ruined horror movies for me when I was about 11. <laughs> um, I, when I was watching the little preview of the, the show, um, there was reference to you know, you going off to Hawaii because your entire career you spent basically taking care of other people and you wanted to, you know, find your own path or whatever. So I kind of wanted to just hear you talk about that. And like, so was your experience while you were going through that career progression, I mean, you were obviously having good times and everything, but was there some sort of like missing thing or yeah, like, what think, was that about? Yeah. Uh, family was always missing for me. Um, I, I adopted four kids. Um, but I was on the road all the time, so I would spend summers with them. So I would, I would say family and sense of self. Like I really, I really had no idea what I would enjoy. I was always living other people's lives. And, and I had, you know, most of the time I had, there were times in the slow periods I would have 20 acts, and the big periods there were 100. Um, so there was always some, and, and my work wasn't, um, it was thinking, so it never ended. There was never enough time in a day to think about how do I make, Lu what does Luther do next? What does Teddy do next? What does Blondie do next? It, it never was over. So I thought um, that a solution for me would be closing my office and going to Hawaii. And what I realized is that um, for, I call retirement, you do the same thing, you just don't get paid for it. Because <laughs> um, at least in my, for me personally, I basically lived the same life I lived when I was working. It hasn't really changed that much. And that the, the I have my family. It, it, I love my kids. They're always around. And it, it's more my perception of not having the family than not really having it. Um, it's, um, and I keep the same self-worth issues that I had, you know, that I thought stopping working would maybe solve. But I, th I think it all, it's one life. Um, and you just stay on your path. Um, and it was time for me to do something else, I guess. We got Mullet. Oh, I will do Michelle real quick. Uh, pleasure to meet you, Shep. Uh, you've managed high performers your entire career. Uh, what recommendation could you give to us specifically on how to help those high performers find that next gear, not, get, uh, not let them rest on their laurels, and, and really manage them to, to continue to elevate their performances? Yeah. I, th I think each one is very, very different. Um, I think if there's one general rule that I used to try and um, give to every artist, whether they were chefs or they were entertainers, that if you allow the public figure to actually be you, you're never going to be happy. Um, and you're never going to be confident because if you, have a, if you take the traits of who you are and, and develop that into a character that you understand, you'll always know what that character should do. So when you're in a press conference, you always know how to answer a question. If it's you personally, you never have the answers. Um, it's really tough. And, and when you take it personal, that's when you start scarring. If a bad review is about that person, you change that person. If a bad review is about you, 
sometimes that wound can be very deep. So I think there's, I don't think you can generalize, but if there's any generality, I would say, is that if, you, if, if someone who's in the public eye can understand that they're not, people aren't loving you, they're loving that character that has been put in front of them. That's not you. You know, even for my movie, I get people who come up to me, you're the greatest, you're unbelievable. They don't know me. They know that guy. So, you know, that's a very, if you can keep that distance in your own brain, it's much healthier. Um, Taki, Joey, Melissa. Donnie. <laughs> so grateful. Thank you. This is beautiful. Uh, you meet a new star, performer, you know, someone you're going to manage, and you find their word, like sex or romance. What do you ask? What do you think to find someone's word? What, what I try and do is I try and, I try and um, make them the face of some cultural revolution. Um, I, 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 I call it cult waves. Um, like right now, um, there's a, the cannabis wave. There's no face to the cannabis wave. Someone's going to, some smart guy is going to become that face. Um, and that's really what I did my whole life. I made the, the, the culinary revolution I didn't make. I caught the wave and put the faces on. You couldn't get a reservation at Spago. When I started, no chef had two restaurants. But you... You could buy your way into a Broadway. You could, you could decide at 9 o'clock in the morning, I want to be at the 50-yard line at the Super Bowl. If you had enough money, you were there. You could be <laughs> in the front row of a Broadway play. You couldn't get into Le Cirque or Spago. I don't care how much money you had, who you were. And demand is the hardest thing to create. They all had demand. They just didn't know how to monetize it, and they hadn't put a face on that demand. Um, so that's what I tried to do with everyone, with Teddy, sexuality. It's a huge wave always. Put his face on it. Alice, the way, you know, make them the face of a, attach yourself to a cultural wave um, because art is very narrow. Um, art appeals to a narrow audience. Um, cultural waves appeal to a gigantic audience. So if you can attach yourself to it and become the face of it, that's what I always tried to do as a manager um, because creating demand is really tough. That's a tough job. Being the face of the, uh, you know, seeing the demand, realizing it's there. I just, uh, the, when I did my last book tour, I, I get a lot of groups of people I had um, who come to me in groups and say, would you do for us what you did for the chefs? Mm -hmm. So I had the cannabis growers come. I've, I've had art dealers. You know, I've had a, a lot of people. My last book tour, by five to one, it was barbers. And it blew my mind because I didn't know about it. And it started, I started looking. And when I drove in L.A., like the prime real estate was a barber shop with a tattoo parlor or a barber shop with a coffee shop. Um, and that's a wave. And no one's taken that wave. There will be a, somebody will grab that wave. Um, so that, that, that was always, I, I, I'm not good enough to create demand, but I'm good enough to cheat and ride the demand. I, I just, I wanted to tell one, I'll try and make it very short, but I think it's a great, so many of you are trying to sell things to people. But, uh, uh, Gypsy Kings are a wonderful study in um, how to think outside the box. Um, I, did, I did the Gypsy Kings because I needed to pay back a fellow at Electra Records um, who had bailed Teddy out. It's a way too long a story to tell, but at a time when we thought Teddy was going to die, he gave him a million dollars to do the record. And I always felt an obligation to him. And um, I had been to San Tropez, and I had seen this group on the beach, the Gypsy Kings. They played on the beach. They had their guitar case out, and people would throw money in. But they became very famous for all the models would go see them. All the beautiful, they always were beautiful women. Um, and I, was, drive, I, I um, was driving in L.A. I had a... Uh, Luther had bought me a white Bentley. I was driving my Bentley. And I was playing the Gypsy King CD that I had bought at San Tropez on the beach. And I got to in front of the Roxy, and this beautiful girl in a car said, is that the Gypsy Kings? I said, wow, she knows Gypsy Kings. She said, can I get a copy of it? And pulled over and gave me her number. And 
send her a copy. And the same thing happened to me a few weeks later. Music's playing, beautiful girl. So I said, wow. I, I, talk, I called the guy at Electra and I told him what happened. I said, I know how to turn that into money. Um, I, I think I can make this work. Will you back me? So we got on a plane. We flew to San Tropez. We signed them. And I'm doing this because I need to pay him back. And we get back, and he gets his whole record company into the room. And the head of promotion says, are you guys crazy? I'll never get a record in Spanish on a radio station in America. And I, uh, duh, holy shit, did I screw this one up? Because he, he was absolutely right. Never really thought about it. So it was, how do you, how do you sell it? And I, I didn't have a, ch- I, I, you know, when you're a manager, you don't have a choice. Artists only have one life. If you don't make it work for them, their life is fucked. You go on to your next act. Um, so anyway, so beautiful women. So I said, how do I get, or the same thing, if I can get all those beautiful women in Radio City Music Hall, I know I can get every guy in the city to come to Radio City because the beautiful women are there. How do I do that? So I had a friend, there was a, a homeless guy who ended up um, being John Paul, uh, yes. Paul Mitchell's partner, um, John Paul. And he would, I had a restaurant, and I used to let him sleep at the restaurant, take showers there. And then he, he ended up owning Paul Mitchell. So he owed me a coupon. This, this is John Paul DeJoria? Yeah, John Paul DeJoria. Who is a billionaire now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Lots of stories. So I called up John Paul, and I said, I'm taking the coupon. He said, what do you need? And I said, I need you to, um, since you talk to every beauty shop, I'm going to give you CDs, coffee cups, and in eight cities, I'm going to give you 50% of the tickets for free to give out in the beauty parlors to the, all their beautiful customers. And they play Gypsy King music, and we gave out the tickets to the half the electric back me, and the rest was history. Because if you get 2,000 beautiful women in a room, you win. <laughs> 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 so we'll probably do another two questions. I know Donnie, you were one. And Jada. And... Okay, we'll do four real quick. <laughs> what was the best advice you ever received? Um, get the money. Don't forget to get the money. <laughs> Always remember to get the money. <laughs> Jerry Wexler, one of the founders of Atlantic Records. I, I, was, I was pontificating about what a good job I was doing, what a thing I was, you know, uh, this is the, I'm the greatest. But, and he said, hey, cut the crap. Here's what a manager does. Get the money, never, you know. <laughs> uh, Jillian? Okay, right there, actually. And then we'll move to uh, Jada. So you've worked with a ton of amazing artists and you're semi-retired-ish, but whether you worked with them or not, what was the last artist that got you really excited and what excited you about them? For me, you know, music, I've never been a music person. Um, I, don't, I don't have a stereo. Um, it's really the culinary world. And I would say the last artist that's really gotten me excited is Roy Choi. Um, his intentions are so amazing. Everything he does, is, his intentions are just so beautiful. And he's a great artist. And he has an amazing set of, he's the fellow who started the Kogi trucks for the you who don't know it, um, which was, for him, it was a way to feed um, at a very low price point good food to people who it isn't accessible to. And by a truck, he could take it to places. And it really revolutionized um, the food delivery system. And he just opened in Watts and in San Francisco with a two-star Michelin chef, um, a place called Locale. It's, sir, it's in, right in the middle of Watson. It's hamburgers and fries at like $5 that are healthy, uh, clean food. He's, he's an amazing guy. Um, he was a gang member. Um, he's a Korean kid who was a gang member, all in and out of jails. Um, one night did an all-nighter, fell asleep in front of the TV, woke up, realized that this didn't happen, but in his brain it happened. Emerald was on TV, came out of the TV, grabbed him, and said, what are you doing with your life? And he went to cooking school the next day and started his journey. Um, so he, he's been an inspiration to me because he, he's that next step of really um, 
understanding that his job is to feed humans, not just rich humans. Um, and that's really important. You talked about compassionate business and win-win. And so I'm curious uh, if you have a moment that is your moment that you were most proud of, of expressing that compassionate business and win-win. Um, I th I, a lot, I've been proud of pretty much everything I've done. But I, th I think with Teddy standing up to the Chitlin circuit was something I'm really proud of, where it became a win-win. You know, every, we ended up with everybody winning. The deal we made with the Black Promoters Association was that if, um, if an Afro-American artist played in a building that promoted its own shows, like um, Radio City Music Hall or the Greek Theater, that they could play for white promoters. Um, if they played in a building that anybody could promote, they could choose a white promoter who would pay them or to stay with their Afro-American promoter. And if we chose a white one, we, we, we forced the promoter to give the uh, black promoter in the city 50% of the profits. So that everybody got taken care of, everybody was happy. The artist was getting paid. Um, so I'm very proud of that. And we'll take the last one. Tony's working hard, sorry. Oh, okay, two, because I told Jay, so last two. Promise last two. I, I've been looking around here, and I see the Dalai Lama behind you. And the Dalai Lama is pretty kick-ass. Like, I think the Dalai Lama is part of it. He's, he's awesome. So what's your relationship with the Dalai Lama? And when you met with him, like, what was the, like, the presence or the thing that you took away? Because he has such a presence about him. He's remarkable. Right. I, I got, so, I, um, he, and you are a great storyteller, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So throw one of those at yeah, us yeah, regarding the Dalai Lama. <laughs> So um, I got taken, when I was living with Sharon, she took me to see him in LA. And because I was with her, we went backstage. And when he walked in the room, I felt like I had taken the best shower of my entire life. It was the cleanest I ever felt. I was really overcome by it. Um, and when I got back to Hawaii, there was a little thing on a bulletin board that he was coming to the Big Island to do a, uh, a retreat at a Dharma Center. And this is back in the, uh, in the early 80s before he was, you know, um, a few hundred people would show up but not 20,000. Um, and Secret Service wasn't with him. It was a very different time. So I, would, I, I decided I, uh, being a groupie of power, um, I had to get next to him. I had, I had to figure out a way to get more of that feeling. And um, I was now in the culinary world. Um, and through Mr. Berger. So I did an offering to do the food for him when he was on the Big Island. I got to the person who had invited Sharon, and they accepted. Um, and um, I actually I thought that he probably was a vegetarian, so that I planned my whole thing around that. But the, I did some research and found that the only thing they really had in Tibet was yak. Um, yaks are a cross between a, a goat and a cow. And they have yak butter, yak meat, yak cheese. That's really the staple, because it's high in the mountain. There's not a lot of vegetables. And I had a friend who did treks to Tibet. So I had him send me yak, uh, yak butter. And they make yak tea out of yak butter, thinking he's going to be in Hawaii. I'm going to blow his mind. It would be like me getting matzo ball soup from someone. You know, <laughs> this is going to be so cool. He's going to love me. I'm going to bring him yak tea. No, no, I get the yak, and it smells up. My, it's the worst smelling thing you've ever smelt in your entire life. Smelt up the whole house, no matter how much I wrapped it up. Um, and then I found out that he didn't like any vegetables. He ate his big meal was 5 in the morning, beef stew, spaghetti, and meatballs. Uh, wild. So, and, and the one thing they told me was, the only thing they told me was, n I had to have no expectations. That I should, if I had an expectation that I was going to interact with them, I shouldn't do the cooking. Because I probably would never interact with them. Mm -hmm. And that they didn't want me to have those expectations. They use the word expectations a lot. Um, <laughs> so I told all my crew we're never going to meet them, no expectations, you know. And um, 
we get there in the morning, and I am so nervous. My first meal's at 5 in the morning, and I, we rented a little house, and I, I actually got in the car naked, forgot to get dressed. <laughs> and, and Paul, and the, my assistant who was with me is looking at me, you, know, you realize you're not dressed? Oh, I was so focused on the cooking. And the, so anyway, I get there and we, we, uh, we make this meal and they come in and they say, you need to bring His Holiness this breakfast. And, oh my, I had no, really no expectation. So I'm, I, they, they cover your mouth with a cloth so you don't breathe on his food. And um, just as a side note, when I told my friend I was doing this, he had sent me a, a book on cooking rice in a monastery. And the book was about 120 pages. And there was only one page on cooking the rice. The rest of it was <laughs> your intentions when you bought the rice, your intentions when you cleaned the rice. It was all about your thoughts. So, anyway, so, so now I'm, the, the tray is sort of shaking, and I go up these steps. and. I walk in and he's brushing his teeth. And he's got his robe down here, about halfway in. And he says, oh, breakfast? And I, yes, your holiness. And uh, he says, oh, thank you. And then, and now I'm thinking, he, he smelled the tea. I am, I'm the coolest guy in the entire world. <laughs> like he's got to, you know, this is real. And he goes, yak tea? And I, oh, yes, your holiness, yak tea. And he goes, oh, that's why I leave Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I ended up cooking for him for uh, three more times that year. And then in New York, someone showed up who actually knew what I did. And um, they asked me to join the board of the government in exile, which I've been a, a board member for the last 15 years or so. Uh, it was the best fun. Mm -hmm. But he always, his signature is, he's so aware that people are in awe and think of him as godlike that I've now seen him so enough times, he always does something like that right off the bat. He does something to make him a human, to level the playing field, and then he goes into what he wants to say. We went to, um, I cooked for him in um, Trinidad, and um, it was very limited. There were, there's um, no Dharma centers, no Buddhists in Trinidad. Um, I couldn't figure out why we were there. I found out the last day why we were there, because it really confused me. As a manager, I would never use his time like that. But I wasn't a manager then. I was cook, so I kept my name. And it turned out that um, he had sat next to a woman in Trinidad uh, in uh, India at a wedding. And she said, would you visit my country? And he said, yes. And she lived in Trinidad, so he said, yes, we were in Trinidad. And that's who he is. But any, So what I was going to say was, so we get to the airport, and there's only two of us on this trip, the security guy and me. And that's sort of it. So the security, we're doing, he's doing a welcoming speech at the airport. And um, Trinidad's unique in that um, the cultures have never merged. So the Africans wear their African robes. The South Americans wear traditional South American. Everybody dressed in their very, you know, we walked into the room and everybody's in their, you know, their own outfits from their countries. His Holiness is in his orange things. And we walk in the room and there was not one, you could hear, you know, not a pin drop. And you could just feel this awe like God had walked in the room. And he goes up to the podium, everybody's like, and he goes, Oh, so sorry. Must be in the wrong room. This costume party? <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knew what to say. And then he looks down at his robe and he says, Oh, I dressed right. <laughs> but he does that all the time. Um, the only thing I cut out of the movie, um, the, when the movie was over, Mike said, I want, you got to see it before I put it out. And the only thing I took out was I told a story about His Holiness, but it was out of context. We, we were, he talked to 10,000 people in Honolulu, and Obama's sister was there. She teaches in Honolulu. And she asked the first question, which is, are you always happy? And he was sitting on a stool with his legs crossed, and hmm, not always happy. Sometimes on toilet. Mm. Mm. 
nothing come out. Mm, not happy. So then, ah, oh, I get so happy. <laughs> but I took it out because out of context, it just seems so bizarre. <laughs> <and I'm> like, <laughs> Wouldn't be good for his brand. Uh, Jay, final question. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just have to say thank you, Jason, for setting this up. And, Shep, your thank stories you. have been absolutely outstanding. Um, I had no idea. So, I, I just have to... I, so, the first record that I snuck to play to annoy my parents... Alice. Bit, yeah, of Billion course, Dollar Baby, right. my, my, my teenage sister. It worked. Um, <laughs> yes. And then for 30 years, almost every Saturday, uh, in a course I, I delivered, we played... Um, Harold Melvin, Wake Up Everybody. Greatest song, um, greatest and, song. And the Gypsy Kings we played almost every Monday night yeah, for 20 years. Thank so you. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. Top of the list. Um, That's a penny, ka <laughs> Yeah, so, so, um, so I, I'm, I, I, honestly, I'm a little boggled and, and, uh, and in awe. Um, but for the rest of your life, if you had a manager to support you and to do what you have done for others, what would a manager do for you? Mm, great question. No idea. <coughs> you know, I don't really know what I'm doing the next day. I, I, mine has all been reactive. I wake up in the morning and I sort of do what I do. I've never, I never said I want to be a manager or I want to manage chefs or I want to make movies. or It's, it's I wake up and I do it. I, I, I resigned my business in a 10-hour period. I, I woke up one night. I... I um, had a premiere in Hollywood, and um, it was a big Hollywood premiere. I was bored to death. I flew to Maui the next day. I was alone on my hammock at sunset, and every molecule in my body was ecstatic. And the next morning, I went to the, I flew to L.A., closed the, resigned from 100 acts, and shut the office. Um, but I, every, it, it, that, I, I feel so blessed and fortunate that I've been able to live my life that way. Um, <coughs> And part of it is probably not having family and not having, so I really can wake up and do what I do. And so I, I don't, I don't have, I don't have those kind of plans for myself. I have no idea what I want to do. I know I want to have a good meal every night, <laughs> for sure. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. As mentioned earlier in the show, we'll be giving away 10 copies of Shep Gordon's book, They Call Me Supermensch, a backstage pass to the amazing worlds of film, food, and rock and roll. That'll be given away in the Community Made group. If you're not a member, lucky for you, it's free. Simply visit communitymade.com to get access. And as a second quick side note, as mentioned earlier in the episode as well, we decided to take some of the concepts of this season on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships and teach them in an intimate workshop setting. To me, there's nothing better than a face-to-face -face experience, I guess you could say, and also from a retention perspective. Podcasts are great, but listening passively to a podcast or reading a book, the retention rate, usually statistically looking at a learning pyramid is around 5 to 15% as opposed to actually participating in a discussion in a live workshop setting. For example, retention can go up as high as 50%. So we decided to launch, I guess, our first workshop, not knowing necessarily how the response to be surprisingly it was really really good we announced it and within a day and a half it sold out so we decided to announce a second date so for dates and availability on that visit superconnectorworkshop.com that's superconnectorworkshop.com if you enjoyed this episode show some love to shep by sending him a message through his website supermensch.com that's supermensch s-u-p-e-r-m-e-n-s-c-h.com i know for a fact that he reads every single message. Also, be sure to include the fact that you heard about him through this show. Before I go, I got to give a quick shout out to Kirsten Reader for leaving the following review on iTunes. She said, this podcast has helped me so much. Jason is so genuine and you know how much he cares about people. I do. It's true. Um, plus, the content of each episode is so applicable. At the end of each episode, I feel like I've learned something without being overwhelmed. Episode one is my favorite. It helped me get clarity on my messaging for what I'm trying to create in my own business. Make time count. Thanks, Jason. No, thank you, Kirsten. I really appreciate it. For the rest of you out there, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast and like what we're doing here at Community Made, I would be forever grateful if you would share this podcast with a friend, leave us a review on iTunes or Facebook, just like Kirsten did. All that stuff goes a long way. Join me for the next episode of Community Made, where I share 
I guess a base framework on how to host a successful mastermind dinner, which ultimately is foundational. A lot of the principles I talk about are foundational for hosting any kind of great live experience. It's going to be a great one. So I look forward to hosting you on the next episode. Enjoy your week.